standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. I want to welcome everybody here to Arosi and to Central California where we are in the fullest of embrace of spring. And we will, as this afternoon, we'll be joining at my property and my wife's where the wildflowers are really tantalizing. I mean, they are beautiful at this time. So not to tease those who won't be able to be there, but I am, I guess. Uh, it is a very wonderful time of the year. And, and we're glad for the Lord that has given us such beauty to look upon. And at that, I'd like to encourage you and, and strengthen you and, and call you to prayer as we worship on this Holy Sabbath day. Will you bow with me in prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts of life that you've given to us and the beauty that we still have. Though we live in a very sinful world, Lord, we know that you're coming as soon and the things that we see now today, we will see in, a, in its greatest glory in, in the heaven to come. We pray now for uh, the service that we are to partake in at this point. We pray for Nick as he presents the, the gospel message to us all. May your blessing be upon him and upon the hearers of this word that your glory and your honor be, may, be, may be fullest in all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this point, I'd like to call Carla up to have our uh, children's story. Thank you. Blessed Sabbath, everyone, boys and girls. Thank you for being here on God's special day, a temple in time that he's given us. Um, if you would, open your Bibles. Turn to Exodus 20, verse 8. Many of you will know already what this is, Exodus 20, God's Ten Commandments. Where he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Nor your, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gate. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It's interesting that God mentions the cattle in his, in his law. Um, I have a very interesting true story for you today to uh, recommend. If you haven't read it yet, you'd probably want to get this book. It's an awesome book. My sister just finished reading it. She was amazed. I think this is maybe one of my most favorite stories, The Seventh Day Ox. It's about the cattle keeping God's Sabbath. You'll want to read it. It's enjoyable. And also we have, uh, remember a few weeks ago we had a story by Sydney, where she brought up the silkworms that were keeping the Sabbath. Silkworms keeping the Sabbath. I just was told about the bees keep the Sabbath. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing that video as well. I'm going to show you now another video here. There we go. I know they're alive because I can. I can Hear them. Can you can hear them inside, inside the lodge. Here. Listen to this. I guess these guys need a day off too. But why did they pick Saturday? Do they even know it's Saturday? Or maybe it's just a coincidence. The only way to find out is to to keep on observing through another week. Obviously come back out of the lodge. They look healthy. So I'll just keep watching and see what's on their schedule for this week. 
Another week of observation. And the beavers were out every day, busy as usual. Sunday through Friday, at about the same time every day. And then came Saturday. And just like the first week, all was quiet again. This continued on week after week, month after month, summer and winter, with the same results. The uh, daughters to come on after this, the daughter comes on and says that um, his, their father has been watching the beavers for 16 years. Oh, wow. And for 16 years, they have always rested on the Sabbath day. He's never seen them out on the Sabbath. All the rest of the week, they're out there busy doing their things, flapping their tails like you saw. But the Sabbath, they are quiet. Isn't that interesting? God's creatures keep the Sabbath. And, uh, and, and also in God's word, it also says that the land is to rest every seventh year. The land is to rest. So something is very important about the Sabbath to God, isn't it? Shouldn't it be at least that important to us? I mean, even the animals are keeping it. The land is resting, and God instructs us to be resting in him. What does it mean to rest in the Lord? Just to put all our faith, all of our trust, all of our burdens on him, and to focus on him. Turn off to the world. Turn on to God just for that day. That it should be a, a temple in time, a special Sanctified time, I would think, is to me is what it means. But uh, anyway, we can look for ways to keep it extra special and to enjoy the Lord in his fullness, which is what he wants for us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your rest day. Help us to realize the significant sanctity of this day and to walk accordingly with you through these 24 hours. We praise you and bless you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Carla. What a great story. Um, our opening hymn is going to be Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, page 458. If we can stand for our opening song.
scripture this morning is found in Romans 9, verses 27 through 29. I'm going to read it from the bulletin. If uh, you want to look that up, Romans 7, verses, Romans 9, excuse me, verses 27 through 29. Messiah also crying concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he shall finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and, as, and been made like unto Gomorrah. So rem, the title is Remnant of the Remnant by Nick and Oshkew. The Remnant of the Remnant. We know we read in the scripture that was just read to us now that the, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, <clears throat> a remnant shall be saved. A remnant shall be saved. And then we also read, except the Lord Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? And so the Lord has a remnant. We know that the Lord has a remnant. Now, Many in the world today, to prove the point that there is inequality in the world, will point out to the top 1%, the top 1% of the world's elites. Others will point to secret societies, uh, to the 32nd degree Masons, or to the 33 degree in the Scottish Rite. Um, Satan has his elect. He has his, his people, his few, that he can rely on, that the few that he can depend on, the few that we, he can uh, trust on. And so and God also has his remnant. He has his few, his, those that he can, he can trust on, those he can rely on. Now I will make, as we go forward here, as we go through the study, I want to look at not only the remnant, but the classes of people in the world. And I think this will kind of help us to look at the biblical classes of people, the biblical categories of people that are in the world, the kind of people that, that the Bible describes. And the aim is not to judge, it's not to condemn here. That's not the point of what I'm trying to do. The aim is to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Jesus tells us, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles. And so we are to prove all things and we are to look at the fruits. I want to begin with the prayer though. Let's kneel. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that um, you have uh, blessed us with uh, the scriptures and that you have promised that there would be a remnant. We want to look at the remnant and the remnant of the remnant. We ask that you'll help us to look at this uh, biblically and to understand the biblical basis for uh, your, your remnant, your people. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's explore the classes of people that are in the world according to the Bible. So the first class of people that you have in the Bible is the children of disobedience, the children of disobedience. They're the nations, they're called the Gentiles. And they are found and depicted in Ephesians chapter five. Let's read there. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be named once among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, because of these things that we just read, cometh the wrath of God upon who? Upon the children of, of what? The children of disobedience. There are children of what? 
of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. You know, John Wesley, commenting about this class of people, he says that we are not to keep company. We are to renounce all association with ungodly men, except, except when duty calls, when there is necessary business, or when providence calls. So there are three reasons that, or three exceptions, I should say, three exceptions that we can associate with the ungodly, with the children of disobedience, with the Gentiles, with the nations. Go no further than is necessary, than necessity requires. What are this class of people? What are this class of people disobeying? Why are they called the children of disobedience? They disobey the word of God. They disobey the law of God. Now in Colossians 3, Paul makes another reference to this class of people. He says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So covetousness is what? Idolatry. idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the whom? On the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Now clearly, this is the dominant class of people in our world. This, we would say, is the ruling class in our world, the children of disobedience. They encompass heathenism, uh, paganism, and lawlessness. Romans 1 and 2 gives you more detail about these people, about this class of people. And it is because of this class of people that Jesus foretold that we would have uh, things like pestilence, wars, rumors of wars, and famines, right? It's because of this class of people. These uh, terrible consequences are not because of, of God's providence. Can't, don't blame God for the famines and the pestilence and the wars. They're not because of God, divine providence. They are the outworking, they are because of lawlessness, the outworking of a principle, which is a, a war, with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. So that's why these things come. That's why they must happen. And by the way, as we go along, I want you to really capture that. Because if you can understand the principles of the gospel, if you can understand what it means to obey and disobey God, to what it means to, to walk after the spirit as, as opposed to walk after the flesh, if you can understand the difference between those two things, then you can see that wars and rumors of wars are inevitable. Famines are inevitable. A disease is inevitable. It's not because God decided, oh, I want disease to happen. Oh, I want a war to happen. No, no, no. It's because of the principles at work in the interaction between men. The principles that are at the root is selfish, are selfish and evil. That's what brings about this condition of things. That's why we have recessions. That's why we have all these things that happen. It's because of lawlessness. Um, but I'm going to go on to another, another class of people. This other class of people is Babylon. In the Bible, there is Babylon of the Chaldeans, and there is prophetic Babylon. And regarding Babylon of the Chaldeans, we read the following. And now I have given these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him, to serve Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was God's servant to punish the people of Israel for their disobedience. As the successor of Nebuchadnezzar disregarded Jehovah, as they disregarded entirely their, the prophetic purposes that God had, they did not behave quite like Nebuchadnezzar. They became uh, far worse in their idolatry, far, far more disobedient. They became a, a type, a foreshadowing of prophetic Babylon. Does that make sense? They became a type or a foreshadowing of prophetic Babylon. Here we read Jeremiah 51. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. 
we also read, we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go everyone to his own country for her judgments reacheth unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. So just as the Babylon of the Chaldeans was prophesied to have, have a sudden fall and judgment reached the hot to the skies, so prophetic Babylon fell when judgments came into remembrance before God. Prophetic Babylon is referred to as that great city. Let's look at Revelation 14. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon is fallen, is why? Why? Because she made all the nations drink of the wrath of her fornication. So similar, similar work that she, but prophetic Babylon does as Babylon of the Chaldeans did. They have a similar work they accomplished. They have a, a similar influence in the world. They make the nations drunk. So just as though here, just as Hosea, in the days of Hosea, I mean, just as Israel was compared to a harlot in the days of Hosea, so the apostate church is called that great whore. She's full of the names of blasphemy and her, and her corruption and her uncleanness, her idolatry makes the nations drunk. Now, this is Rome since the sixth century. And this is what Rome has done. She has made the nations, we know this, have made the nations partake of those doctrines. And we see its effects on a lot of different denominations of these doctrines that are not biblical. Rome is also represented in the leopard-like beast of Revelation 13. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now this is the reason that some denominations die, but Rome never dies, right? <laughs> Rome has flourished and maintained its power since the sixth century because of the authority and the power invested in her. She will not go away until the judgments of God finally are poured out on her. It's here in the, in the book, Great Controversy. There's a better explanation of this. The great sin charged against Babylon is that she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This cup of intoxication which she presents to the world represents the false doctrines which she has accepted and as the result of her unlawful connection with the great ones of the earth. So in Revelation 17, this, this great whore, as she's called, Babylon the Great is called the mother of harlots. And so now this introduces another class of people, another class of people, the daughters of Babylon, the Protestant fallen churches, the daughters of Babylon, because the first Babylon is the mother of harlots, so she must have daughters. We read, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was written the name Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations. So if Babylon is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, it must mean that she has daughters, as we said earlier. I like how Great Controversy explains this. Great Controversy says, Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized the churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. Okay, so that's what that means. It cannot refer to the Romish church. It cannot refer for that church has been in a fallen condition for many years centuries, many centuries, she says. And then go on to read, furthermore, in the 18th chapter of Revelation, in a message which is yet future, the people of God are called upon to come out of Babylon. According to the scripture, many of God's people must still be in Babylon. And in what religious bodies are the greater part of the followers of Christ now to be found? What, where are they found? Without a doubt, in the various churches professing the Protestant faith in the various churches professing the Protestant faith. This is a sad condition. 
those churches who protested against the sins of Babylon have become the daughters of Babylon. This is a very sad thing. Peter, though, warns us about the teachers of, in this class. These, this, this, of, this daughter of Babylon, these daughters of Babylon have many teachers, many false teachers. We read about Peter's warning. He says, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. I've seen this. I've see, been with, uh, with people who speak very lightly of God, who make his scriptures into a joke, make it, scriptures into a, a trivial humor. That's what this is referring to. They walk after the flesh, the lust of uncleanness. That's what Peter is describing. It's as if he walked into a mega church today, really. It's as if he walked and he saw what was happening and he wrote it down. Let's read on. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken, these teachers, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they counted pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of, and that cannot cease from sin. Notice it says they cannot do what? They cannot cease from what? Sin, because of course they believe that you sin till Jesus comes anyway. But they cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous, covetous practices. Cursed children, which have forsaken their right way and are gone astray, falling the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam. Balaam was the prophet who presumed upon God and made the nations that were tempting Israel to, uh, to draw them in with uncleanness, with, with fornication and adultery. So this is just what we see in the churches today. The churches of Babylon, the fallen churches, are indulgent, they're lawless, they're carnal. The daughters of Babylon and all all these false teachers will lead to the mark of the beast crisis, of course. But I want to, to go and point out something that's been happening over the last 10 years. It's sort of interesting. I don't, I don't know what will come of it for sure. I know what will come of the Protestant churches. I know what will come of, um, of no, the mother of harlots. I know what Bi the Bible says about them, of, of Rome. We know... But it's interesting, I'm reading about this ruling class in the Russian government, and it has demonstrated an interest in reviving in the old Christianity. In 2018, uh, for the first time, Putin declared that Christianity is the foundation of the Russian state. Now, I find this a twist of irony, because in the 1950s, Nikita Khrushchev, boasted that religion in the USSR would become obsolete by 1965. In other words, he says, in about 15 years, you will not have Christianity in Russia. Khrushchev insisted that at least one Christian would be preserved and placed in a museum so that future generation of Soviets could view the extinct species. Okay? So contrast this thinking in the 50s with today. In 2018, Putin adopted Christianity as a starting point for the formation and development of the Russian statehood, the true spiritual birth of our ancestors, the determination of our identity, the flowering of national culture and education. Okay, so he's adopted. Obviously, this is pointing to what? A union of church and state in Russia. In fact, when Putin was speaking to a club of uh, Olympian at the Olympics in 2014 in Sochi. He said to have children taught that a boy can become a girl and vice versa is on the verge of a crime against humanity. He claimed supporters of the transgender rights are pushing an end to basic things such as mother, father, family, or gender differences. 
He said Russia should maintain its spiritual values and historic traditions and avoid the socio-cultural disturbances of the West. And so uh, that's what he's fighting for. So all this, all this has shaped up, some historians are shaping up a theory about Putin. All this in their minds. They think Putin views himself as the holy emperor, the new holy emperor. Religious historian Diana Butler Bass has described Russia's invasion of Ukraine in these words. The world is witnessing a new version of an old tale, the quest to recreate an imperial Christian state, a neo-medieval holy Roman empire, uniting political, economic, and spiritual power into an entity to control earthly and heavenly destiny of the European people. So, um, it's, it's mind-blowing. Uh, she believes that Putin, what Putin is doing in Ukraine is a dream gripping some quarters of the West for a coalition unifying religious conservatives into some kind of supranational neo-Christendom. A supranational neo-Christendom. She says the theory is to create a partnership between American evangelicals, traditionalist Catholics in Western countries, and Orthodox people to unite everyone under the auspices of the Russian Orthodox Church in a common front against the enemies of secularism, Islam, and the rise of China, too, in, in what she views. And so this is quite a lot to swallow. It's as if she's saying, you know, Jerry Falwell, you're not doing good enough. Russia will take the reins, right? <laughs> We're going to hasten this prophetic thing all the way. I mean, I know he's not saying that, but it's as if he's doing that. Uh, it's as if he thinks the Americans have failed, they're, dropped, they're dropping the ball, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to make Christendom, create a neo-Christian Christian state. I don't believe this is going to take a lot of shape, but I believe that it will, they'll play an important role, though, in that part of the world. So in his mind, uh, bloodshed is better than decadence. The sins of pleasure-seeking are replaced with the sins of cruelty and bloodshed. Um, so it's, it's, they're all sins. Now, you look at the condition of, these, of, of the Orthodox Church and of the Protestant churches, they're all breaking the first four commandments. Every one of them is. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and then they're breaking also the fifth commandment. They, they, break, they don't, in the West, like to break the sixth commandment. At least on paper, they don't. Russians make the exception because they view themselves seemingly as defenders of true faith, quote unquote. But nobody's really following the law of God. The Bible says, Jesus told us, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. By the way, the word for iniquity is lawlessness. It's anomia, lawlessness. Because of lawlessness, the love of many shall wax cold. And we see that in the East and the West, in it, because of lawlessness. Great Controversy tells us, those who refuse to submit to the government of God are wholly unfitted to govern themselves. Wholly unfitted to govern themselves. So as we've seen so far, that when we understand the principles at work between obedience and disobedience, between walking in the spirit and walking after the flesh. We understand those differences. We can see that the prophetic events really are inevitable. The wars, the famines, and the mark of the beast crisis. These are not just, not just might happen, they will happen. They must happen unless the world amends its ways. It's not looking like it's going to do that if the church is nowhere near doing it either. So we'll look at another class of people. We saw that, uh, actually look at these classes, we saw that the children of disobedience, the nations, they are lawless. We saw Babylon, and Babylon is also lawless. We saw the daughters of Babylon, they are also lawless, as Peter described them, they're walking after the flesh. So next we'll look at the, another class of people called Israel, the Jewish people. In Romans 9, it tells us that Israel is privileged, right? It has privileges, and it tells us there are two kinds of Israelis. Who are Israelites? To whom pertain the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, 
and the promises. Whose are the fathers? And of whom concerning the flesh Christ came? Who is over all? God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. You've got to take note of that. Romans 9, 6. They are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as seed. And so it's not the children of flesh, as dispensationalists will insist. It's not the genealogical descendants of, of Abraham that are children of Israel. It is the children of who, what? Children of promise. The children of promises are counted for seed. So today, I suggest that it is because the children of promise, those who take the word of God, that Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh-day Remnant, Seventh-day um, seventh Reform, Seventh-day other denominations, these are Israel. How do I know this? Because the Seventh-day whatever are the only people, generally speaking, not always, they're the only people who take the whole of Scripture. And you think I'm exaggerating. I'll, I'll explain this in a minute. Because the Bible says, what advantage then has it to Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly. Because unto them were committed the oracles of God. Unto them were committed what? The oracles of God. And so, the, I, say, I, I propose the idea that Israel, be it children of promise or children of flesh, either way, Israel is Seventh-day Church of Revelation, Seventh-day Adventism, Seventh-day Remnant. Why? Because accepting the Old and New Testament is baked into their beliefs. Most churches in the churches of fallen churches of Babylon do not accept the Old Testament. They are New Testament Christians. They do not have the oracles of God. Many of them believe in the New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs. That's the kind of Bibles they pass around. They are not Bible Christians. They do not have the oracles of God. <clears throat> but it's not safe to be in Israel just because you're in Israel. I hope you understand that, because there's children of the flesh and children of the promise. Um, additionally, Seventh-day Church of Revelation, Seventh-day Adventists, they have something else. They have the spirit of prophecy. Now you say, well, the other churches have a spirit of prophecy too. Yes, but they are false prophets. These are people who are false prophets. It's not, they're not false prophets because they made false predictions about COVID or because they made false predictions about Trump. They're false prophets, again, because they don't embrace all of Scripture. They don't embrace all of Scripture. That's why they're false prophets. They are New Testament-only Christians. So it's not enough to be, to be in Israel. You know, in Israel you had Sadducees who didn't even believe portions of the, of the prophets. The Sadducees didn't believe the prophets. There you had the Pharisees, you had the scribes, you had the priests, you had the rabbis. And so just because you're in Israel doesn't mean you're safe. And so we must be, we must be children of what? Children of promise. Children of promise. Before I go on, I want to review. We looked at that there are uh, children of disobedience, and they have dire consequences because of lawlessness. that are inevitable. We have Babylon. Babylon is, is lawless, and uh, inevitably they, their way leads to infamy and death. We have daughters of Babylon, and then we know the daughters of Babylon, as we read in 2 Peter, that they are lawless, that they are carnal. And we have Israel. In Israel, we have those who walk after the flesh and those who walk after the spirit. But in Israel, you have the disciples. The disciples of Jesus accepted Jesus as the Son of God. When Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, 
Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You see, the faithful disciples, the children of promise, accept Jesus as the only begotten Son of God. And among the disciples, we have the virgins, and the virgins accept all of the promises of God. In the parable of Matthew 25, there were ten virgins who went out to meet the bridegroom. Five were wise, five were foolish. The wise took extra oil with them. Five of the wise took the extra oil. And the foolish didn't take extra oil. They, didn't take, they just took the lamps only. At midnight, they were all, they were all sleeping because it took hours for the, for the, for the groom to come. The, the, the groom took forever to come. They, were, they fell asleep. And at midnight, they, hold, they heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. They all rose up. They're all awake at that point. But the foolish were out of oil. And they asked the wise, Give us your oil. And what did the wise tell the foolish? No, we can't give you oil. If we do, we'll run out. We'll all be out of oil. And so they told the foolish, Go buy. Go, go buy some more. Go buy oil. And the foolish went to buy, and the wise waited for the, for the, for the wedding marriage, marriage procession to go by. They joined it. They went into the marriage. They go into the marriage. The door is shut. And at that point, after the door is shut, the, the foolish come, but they are told, I know you not. I know you not. And they're left outside of the marriage. All this, all this, Christ and his disciples actually had witnessed. They were on the Mount of Olives. We read in Christ's object lessons, they were on the Mount of Olives. And they're looking down on the streets below, and they saw all this before their eyes. So Christ, witnessing this happening, used that as an illustration to, to illustrate the experience of the church just before the coming of Jesus, just before the second coming. Two classes of watchers are represented, we're told. The two classes profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure what? A pure faith. By the lamp is represented the word of God. The psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Okay? They all profess a pure faith. A time of waiting intervenes. Faith is tried, and when the cry is hold, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're going to talk about these foolish virgins. Foolish virgins. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. Okay, they're not like the scribes and the Pharisees. Get this in your mind. They are not like the scribes and the Pharisees. They're not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They advocate the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. Okay, so the foolish virgins are not, are not hypocrites, but they fail to do something. They believe the truth, but it has not changed them. They have not cooperated with God to be transformed by it. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers. They receive the word with readiness, but they fail of assimilating its principles. Its influence is not abiding. You know, this reminds me, these stony ground hearers are like, like the disciples in John chapter 6. They were so excited by Jesus because he, made, he gave them food in the wilderness. There, you know, lots of people are excited about Jesus. You hear people who get excited about Jesus. They, they want to be Christians. That's, that's what's happening in John chapter 6. There are people that are excited about Jesus. They're on fire for the Lord until they hear the truth. You must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, meaning that they must, his words are spirit and they are life. They must partake of his words. They must partake of his doctrine. And when that is brought to them, what do they do? They depart. Many of the disciples, it says, walked with him no more. Right? So don't just get excited about the truth. 
Don't just get excited about the truth. It's not enough to want it. You must choose it. The Spirit works upon men's, man's heart according to his desire and consent, implanting in him a new nature. So the Spirit works in men's heart according to what? According to his desire and consent. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. They do not know God. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Their service to God de degenerates into a form. This is sad. This is tragic. They have the truth. They have the right doctrines. But they do not know God. Another characteristic of the foolish version is this is the class that in a time of peril are found crying peace and safety. They lull their hearts into security and dream not of danger. The grace of God had been freely offered to every soul. The message of the gospel has been heralded. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. But character, notice this, character is not what? Character is not transferable. Not transferable. No man can believe for another. No man can receive the Spirit for another. No man can impart to another the character which is the fruit of the Spirit's working. It is in a crisis the character is revealed. When the earnest voice is proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and the sleeping virgins were aroused from their slumber. It was seen whose who had made the preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. The ten virgins are watching in the evening of, the earth, of this earth's history. Are you watching? We're all watching, aren't we? We're all watching. All claim to be Christians. Do we all claim to be Christians? Of course we do. I think, I hope we all do. All have a call, a name, a lamp. All profess to be doing God's service. Do you profess to be doing God's service? All apparently wait for Christ appearing, but five are unready. Five will be found surprised, dismayed, outside the banquet call. Saddest of all words that ever fell upon mortal year are those words of doom. I know you not. Saddest of all words, I know you not. Let's look at the wise virgins. The wise virgins. In the parable, the wise virgins had oil in their vessels with their lamps. Their light burned with undimmed flame through the night of watching. It helped to swell the illumination for the bridegroom's honor. Shining out in the darkness, it helped to illuminate the way to the home of the bridegroom, to the marriage feast. This is God's service. It's not just passing out tracts. It's not just, you know, doing busy work. This, that's important too. I'm not denying that's important. But it's, it's actually shining out, being filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's shining out of you as a fragrance wherever you go, the way you speak, the way you interact with people, the way you relate to people. So the followers of Christ are to shed light into the darkness of the world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God. Again, this becomes, this becomes inevitable. This becomes predictable. If the principles are implanted, uh, the principles of truth are implanted in us, then what happens? We develop the attributes of God. We have the character of God, the, the Christ's righteousness, the righteousness with, that was manifested without the law, but being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's what we have. Oh, it's so, so critical to have that righteousness, to have the oil. To the light of his glory, his character, is to shine forth in his followers. Thus they are to glorify God. Ah, that's how we glorify God. 
to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home, to the city of God, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the work that we can do for the children of disobedience, for the children for, for Babylon, for the daughters of Babylon, for Israel, for Israel, those in Israel who are, who are as children of the flesh and not children of the promise. Because see, if you do these things, if you are filled, partake of the word and, and of the spirit of God to transform you, to change your life, to conform you to the likeness of Jesus, if you allow that to happen in your life, if you can do that, you can be a light to everyone. Doesn't matter what they are. If they are children of disobedience of Babylon, daughters of Babylon or Israel, you are also then not just of the five virgins, you're also a faithful disciple, you're a faithful servant. You are a child of promise, not a child of the flesh. The wise virgins are the remnant of the remnant. Now, to human eyes, all ten virgins are the remnant. All virgins have the pure faith, profess true Christianity, and are watching for the signs of the times. Yet in the eyes of God, only the five wise virgins are the remnant. Only the wise virgins partake of the Spirit and are transformed into the likeness of Christ, and in the eyes of God, they are the remnant. But from a human perspective, the, you know, we see the ten virgins of the remnant. And so when we find that only five, the five are the, are the remnant, then we think from a human perspective, it's the remnant of the remnant. We cannot faultlessly discern who are wise and who are foolish. And this is not our task anyway. But we should take warning that we know God and that we are known of God and that we partake of His Spirit. And we read about them, these five wise virgins. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion with him at 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being fruits unto God and to the Lamb. The 144,000 are the five wise virgins. The five wise virgins. So we see here, we'll look at the children of disobedience, paganism, heathenism, lawlessness, Babylon that promotes false doctrines, the daughters of Babylon. We see Israel, and these are a dominant class. These are a ruling class in many ways in our world. And there you have God's virgins. They're the ones, they're the true disciples. They're the ones who have a pure faith. But among those who have the pure faith, five are foolish, five are wise. So let us pray that we be among the five that are wise. Let us kneel. Lord, we thank you for the pure faith. We thank you for the pure doctrine. I ask that, Lord, you will work in us both to do and to, to will and to do of your good pleasure, to conform us to the image of Jesus, that we may be as the wise virgins, as children of promise, not children of the flesh, that we may be faithful servants and truly friends as Abraham was when he walked with you. I ask that you will bless us and guide us on the Sabbath. I ask that you help us to be as wise virgins on the Sabbath, to be faithful and true. We, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Nick. Um, our closing song will be It Is Well With My Soul, page 495. Can we stand for that last song, please?
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message that we have received. We thank you for the blessings and the promises that you have given that we know are sure. Lord, will you be with us in the days ahead when times will be harder than we can even imagine. But we know that we can put our whole trust in you. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth.